Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Dr. Bhanu Priya Rohila from Mohanlal Sukharia University and today's lecture deals with John Keats famous poem Ode on Melancholy. The poem is a part of the fourth unit of the paper British Romantic Literature as per the CBCS syllabus run by Utkal University for semester 3 of BA English Honours. The present poem is one of the major odes written by Keats which are still considered remarkable literary pieces of the romantic literature. Now before we move on to the text of the poem let us first get familiar with John Keats. Although we have discussed him already in the first unit of the syllabus, but here I would like to discuss him in detail so that it will be easier for all of us to understand both the poems which are there in our syllabus. This is John Keats whom we have discussed as the second generation poet of the Romantic era. So John Keats was born in 1795. Keats lived for, for 25 years only but the magnitude of his life can be mapped through his literary works. He was trained as an apothecary and thereby he was both a poet and a physician. But later on, he devoted himself completely to poetry. He wrote around 54 poems, including sonnets, odes, ballads, lyrics and others. He was closely associated with Charles Clark and Leigh Hunt. Both of them were among the most prominent and significant figures of the literary world of the time and Leigh Hunt was the founder of the famous newspaper The Examiner. Keats wrote several letters to Hunt and those letters have his poetic philosophy and his ideals. His letters have been of great help to the scholars and the critics to understand his philosophies and his poetry. He died of tuberculosis at Rome in 1821. Just like his contemporary Shelley, Keats was also known for his love and passion for beauty and ancient Greek culture. But the two poets were different in their approach. Shelley was a revolutionary and had a futuristic vision for beauty. 
whereas on the other hand keats found beauty in past for him the ancient times and cultures stood as the idea of beauty keats published his first volume of poems in 1817 but unfortunately it gained no attention of the contemporary scholars his sonnets like chapman's homer and sleep and beauty are the only notable works from it in 1818 he came up with endymion and was criticized ruthlessly by some magazines and periodicals because of his liaisons with lehunt thereafter came lamia both endymion and lamia are inspired from greek mythology he also wrote isabella or the pot of basil which is based on boccaccio's decameron the eve of saint agnes the ballad la belle dame sans merci and hyperion are among his well known works his best works came in 1820 these were his odes to a nightingale ode on a gracian urn ode on melancholy to autumn to psyche and bards of passion and of mirth are the odes which are the most celebrated odes not only in romantic era but in the history of english literature too his poetry characterized uh, with its sensuousness hellenism medievalism and uh, its seriousness has always been praised by the scholars and critics of all the times he had a great sense of beauty and therefore he found beauty in everything like he found beauty in past in nature in medieval romances in greek myths and other things too his pictorial imagination was remarkable his language has been rich and refined and this enhanced the sensuousness of his poems which means his poems appeal to the senses even the touch taste and smell this was about the poet john keats now let us move forward and uh, discuss Uh, the poem of the day ode on melancholy first we see here uh, what an ode is and then we shall discuss about the theme of the poem that is melancholy what is an ode an ode is a lyrical poem which is mostly addressed to someone or something in order to praise it or to glorify it this was originated in greece so it was a greek form of poetry and it was used to celebrate victories kings and other things The odes were mostly sung with musical accompaniments and lyre was the most common instrument played with it but it was not a rule so they could be, uh, they could be sung without the instruments as well the traditional or the classical ode is structured mostly into three parts these three parts are strophe antistrophe and epode these are the small lyrics or the verse units of the ode later on there came other variants of ode into being and thus there are three types of odes first is pindaric ode 
which is named after the Greek poet Pindar. Then there is Horatian Ode, named after the Roman poet Horace. And then comes the Irregular Ode, which follows neither Pindaric nor the Horatian style of ode. But in total, odes are poems or lyrics which are written to celebrate someone or something using highly elaborate language to express very sincere emotions and feelings towards the person or the event or the thing. Therefore, they are ceremonious and formal in tone. This form of poetry was very popular among the English Renaissance poets and later on the Romantic writers also popularized it. In your syllabus of this paper, you have two odes by Keats and he mostly used the irregular form of odes. And the first ode that is uh, on melancholy which is celebrating a mental state or a condition using the Greek mythological references and the second one is addressed to an object that is an urn or a vase there. Now let us move on to the topic of the poem now. In this poem, Keats is celebrating melancholy. So, melancholy is basically sadness. Since ancient times, melancholia has been taken as a part of medicine and is considered as a bile disorder which generates sadness in a person. In literature, several works have talked about this mental state of mind which is unavoidable in human life. But in literature, it has been presented as an aesthetic emotion which is beyond just sadness. There can be many other emotions included in it like love, longing, grief and so many others. Literature has mostly looked at the positive aspects of this negative human emotion and has not denounced it completely. Sadness Pensiveness, gloom, sorrow and darkness are a few words that typically represent the mood very appropriately. In several works of literature, this emotion has added beauty and sensitivity. From Renaissance to the present, this emotion in literature is a well-received and desired emotion. We can see uh, Shakespeare through his melancholic Jakes in drama, Robert Burton in his book Anatomy of Melancholy in prose, Milton in his poem uh, Il Penseroso in poetry and uh, several other novelists in their novels have successfully portrayed this emotion. These are just a few examples from among the popular works of literature. So we can say that in literature, the beauty of this emotion has always been there and Keats also in this poem has portrayed it as something which should be celebrated and should not just be condemned or criticized. Keats is known as the poet of beauty and sensuousness, but his idea of beauty is related to life. He in this poem 
has resorted to a very similar standpoint to his other poems wherein in ode of uh, a ode on a gracious urn he emphasizes on the impermanence of beauty in real life he talks that things emotions passions and situations are transient and changeable and subject to decay and deterioration this changeability or decay in the end leads to a burning forehead and a parching tongue the very state that he refers to the physical uh, physical characteristic of melancholy in this poem as the pale forehead in the first stanza then in his another work endymion where he opens up with a thing of beauty is the joy forever which is a very famous line in literature keats here is talking about the joy of beauty it is interesting to note that here in endymion the impact of beauty is a permanent thing for the same poet who speaks of both beauty and joy as impermanent in ode on melancholy so this in itself is an acceptability of the changeable nature of human emotions in this ode of melancholy he stresses that every joy beauty nature and every emotion of delight has melancholy at its core and that is the essence which is to be accepted and embraced moving on to the text we now begin with the first stanza which reads as no no go not to lethe neither twist wolf's bane tight rooted for its poisonous wine nor suffer thy pale forehead to be kissed by night shade ruby grape of proserpine make not your rosary of euberries nor let the beetle nor the death moth be your mournful psyche nor the downy owl a partner in your sorrows mysteries for shade to shade will come too drowsily and drown the wakeful anguish of the soul so here the speaker who is the poet himself is addressing the reader or it seems like he is addressing someone who he assumes to be a sufferer of melancholy or sadness and here he starts by giving some instructions or advice to the listener or the sufferer he tells such a person not to do certain things he begins the first line with the word no that to twice for emphasizing it and says not to go to lethe lethe is a greek word for oblivion which means forgetfulness and here it is also an allusion from the greek mythology according to which it is one of the rivers of hades the underground or the infernal region and whoever drinks its water they forget their past then secondly the poet says neither twist wolf's bane wolf's bane which is also known as monk's hood is a plant which is poisonous and can be fatal to humans so he says that don't use this plant and its poisonous wine this plant was used for medicinal purpose by greeks 
so here the poet dissuades him to take it for further he says don't let your pale forehead so pale forehead is a psychological characteristic of a melancholic person so he says that don't let it be kissed by nightshade now nightshade is again a poisonous plant which is also used medicinally so if someone consumes it in more than required quantity it will lead him to unconsciousness or sometimes it can lead him to death as well and the poet also call, calls the nightshade as the ruby grape of proserpine here again we have another allusion from the greek mythology according to which proserpine or sometimes also called as proserpine was brought to hades and thus she was made the queen of the underworld she was the daughter of demeter who governs all the seasons and thus seasons and fertility are both associated with proserpine as well in roman culture proserpine is the goddess of wine so here the poet calls nightshade the ruby grape of hers and grapes as we know are wine metaphorically and thus if the sufferer drinks the wine made of nightshade he will go to the underworld or in other words he will die the wine will kill him so the poet warns the sufferer against drinking the sparkling wine even if proserpine allures him addressing the sufferer he further says that one should not make the rosary of euberes so euberes is again another poisonous plant though it has a sweet tasting fruit but here the poet is referring to probably the rest of the tree since the rosary is made of the wooden part of a tree and what is the rosary so rosary is a necklace like string mostly made of wooden pieces to be used while worshiping and for counting prayers so he says that don't make a rosary of a poisonous plant since it will be uh, of like praying to death and nobody likes to pray to death so we see that the poet has referred here to several poisonous plants all these plants are used as medicine too but at the same time they are taken if they are taken in more than required quantities it may kill a person and it is very common that a melancholic person uses all these as as remedies against their sorrowful mental state to numb the pain of heart or mind that is why the poet here advises the melancholic person not to seek any refuge in any of these remedies continuing this in the next line he says nor let the beetle nor the death moth be your mournful psyche that is don't let the beetle or the death moth both of these insects are widely considered as bad luck it is a superstition that if these insects sit over someone it will uh, bring death omen to them so the poet says that don't let them control your psyche and psyche represents both heart and the mind so he says that don't make them sorrowful 
Here we see that the word psyche is a proper noun with its capitalized P. In Greek mythology, psyche rules both the soul and the mind. So he says that don't let it be moundful. In line with this, he also says, nor the downy owl, a partner in your sorrows, mysteries. A downy owl symbolizes night, gloom, darkness and death. So the poet says that don't make it a partner in your sorrows which are mysterious that is the sorrows are due to some obscure reasons. So taking the owl's help and letting the owl be a partner to relieve yourself in your sadness is also not advisable. And then in the last couplet of this stanza he says for shade to shade will come too drowsily and drown the wakeful anguish of the soul. So shade to shade that is one after another remedy will happen gradually and all will drown or sink the wakeful which means disturbed or sleepless suffering of the soul. So the remedies will sink or reduce the anguish of the soul. Here in the first stanza, the poet advises the sufferer not to go for certain remedies in which he says that will give a temporary relief to the sufferer from his sorrow. But he advises him to go against it which is quite surprising why the poet is stopping the sufferer to take any medicines or remedies to lessen the pain of the soul or cure his melancholy mood. Probably we will get the answer in the coming stanzas. Now moving on to the second stanza Keats says but when the melancholy fit shall fall, sudden from heaven like a weeping cloud that fosters the droop-headed flowers all and hides the green hills in an April shroud. Then glut thy sorrow on a morning rose or on the rainbow of the salt sand wave or on the wealth of globed peonies or if thy mistress some rich anger shows imprison her soft hand and let her rave and feed deep deep upon her peerless eyes so the first stanza talked about what one should not do to deal with melancholy. And here in the second one, he creates a contrast from the first one and says, but when the fit or the spasm of melancholy will fall suddenly from the heaven it will be like a weeping cloud. So here he uses the simile of weeping cloud for melancholy. A weeping cloud that fosters, that is, that nurtures the droop-headed flowers. That is dull looking flowers. So although the cloud is weeping or crying out of sorrow, but still it nurtures the flowers which are dull and further hides the green hill in an April shroud. Shroud is the fog and mist that dwell upon the green hills in April. Then he says glut thy sorrow. So glut is to eat or to feed. So in these lines 
he says that feed your sorrow or feed your sorrowful soul on three things the first thing he says is a morning rose so the morning rose is one of the most beautiful and refreshing things in life but it does not last long its freshness dies at as the day approaches then he says or glut thy sorrow on the rainbow of the of the salt sand wave here the salt sand wave is to signify sea or the ocean so this is the rainbow of the sea that again does not last long and then the third thing he says is the wealth of globed peonies so peonies are beautiful small round flowers so because of their round shape they are called globed here and at the same time the poet calls it a wealth peonies bloom in a large number on its plant so the poet has very appropriately called it a wealth which again does not last long too so unlike the first stanza here the poet advises about what a melancholy person should do he should look at these beauties which are not permanent so in contrast with the first stanza this stanza talks about what the poet suggests the sufferer to do and in the last three lines of this stanza he shifts the focus from nature to humans and says or if thy mistress some rich anger shows so either you glut your sorrow on the things like rose and rainbow and peonies or if your beloved shows annoyance to you then you should imprison her soft hand that is you should hold her hand and let her rave let her glow and feed deep deep upon her peerless eyes here it shows that the poet is suggesting the sufferer to get passionately involved with the beloved but this also does not last very long so keats again here hints at sensuousness of love as he does for nature earlier now moving on to the third and the last stanza of the poem keats says she dwells with beauty beauty that must die and joy whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu and aching pleasure nigh turning to poison while the bee mouth sips a in the very temple of delight wild melancholy has her sovereign shrine though seen of none save him whose strenuous tongue can burst joy's grape against his palate fine his soul shall taste the sadness of her might and be among her cloudy trophies hung he begins this stanza by talking about melancholy who is personified so here the pronoun she stands for the goddess melancholy this personification of this emotional state reminds me of john milton's famous poem il penseroso written um, in 1645 which talks of il penseroso that is the serious man or the pensive man and he invokes 
the goddess melancholy to live with him here in this poem too keats talks about her and says that she lives with beauty and joy but the worldly beauty dies soon and joy always is ready to say goodbye here both beauty and joy are also personified so it means melancholy lives with beauty and joy but they leave her soon and the third one who melancholy lives with is pleasure which is aching that is painful the word nai means close by here keats used keats has used oxymoron in the phrase aching pleasure and the pleasure is turning into poison as the bee sips the nectar and this is why the pleasure is aching following this he says melancholy has her sovereign that is independent shrine in the temple of delight delight is again personified here and though melancholy and delight are opposite in nature to each other but again delight always comes with melancholy they approach the the human beings one after another and the poet portrays melancholy as wild since it is the temple of delight and melancholy finds that her, uh, finds that as her shrine and who can see her when she uh, when she is wild the poet talks about this in the next two lines so who can see though seen of none save him whose strenuous tongue can burst joys grape against his palate fine so it means the wheel melancholy can only be seen by the one whose strenuous tongue that is whose spirited or lively tongue can burst joys grape against his palate fine so it is a kind of a visual imagery which keats has beautifully portrayed here uh, it is quite typical of keats poetry and one can imagine how grapes burst when you put them in mouth and as it bursts the juice feels against your palate which means only the one who can feel that sort of enjoyment or the one who can feel such a joy he only can see melancholy who is wild and then comes the final couplet of the poem that says his soul shall taste the sadness of her might and be among her cloudy trophies hung so continuing the thought of the previous couplet the speaker here says that such a person who can feel joy to its core only such a person can see her and can taste the sadness of her power and once he feels that power or that sadness he can be among her cloudy trophies which means that melancholy earns such persons as its trophies here the poet says that one cannot enjoy the true essence of sadness if one is not spirited now look back at the first stanza again and now we understand why the speaker advises the sufferer against certain remedies to get rid of melancholy or to lessen the effect of sadness in the last line of the stanza he says 
and drown the wakeful anguish of the soul so the poet wants the listener to keep that anguish alive and active so that one can enjoy melancholy as well thus in the end the poet suggests through all the things that provide human beings with joy and beauty and delight that they are all transient things and after these emotions melancholy which is an inseparable part of delight and joy would certainly come and one should be able to enjoy this emotion of gloom as well now let's discuss the structure of the poem the poem is an ode and what is an ode we have already discussed in detail in the beginning of this lecture and this ode has three stanzas each consisting of 10 lines the stanzas are divided into two parts the first part is a quatrain having four lines and the second part is a sestet having six lines the rhyme scheme of the first two stanzas is a b a b c d e c d e while the third one has a slightly different rhyme scheme in the last three lines of the sestet and comes as a b a b c d e d c e the meter used here is iambic pentameter so penta is 5 so that means each line has 5 metrical feet and i am is a metrical foot that has one unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable so it has an iambic pentameter the poem is rich in literary devices so let us now discuss the literary or poetic devices here keats who is known for his visual imageries has deployed this technique very aptly in this poem as well one can find the visual images of flowers plants uh, insects birds season rivers wine grapes temples and many other things keats has used them as symbols for nature and delight the plants like nightshade and wolf's bane insects like beetle and death moth bird like owl and the river lethe have been used for symbolizing death whereas the rose the peonies and the rainbow symbolize the brighter aspects of life and at the same time connote impermanence or the transitoriness of life similarly the beloved beauty joy and pleasure also represent the same temporariness of emotions he has used several allusions from greek mythology lethe proserpine and psyche etc are all characters of greek mythology from greco roman medicine to superstitions and their beliefs are found in the poem so we can see that the greek mythology is very prominent in the whole poem along with the allusions personification has also been used very appropriately in the poem melancholy and the other mental and emotional states like psyche joy delight pleasure all have been personified here the weeping cloud and the droop headed flowers 
personify the natural elements. Next in line is anaphora. Anaphora is the repetition of words or phrases in the beginning of the lines of the poem. In this poem, in the first stanza, the use of the word nor and in the second stanza, the repetition of the word or are the examples of anaphora. Next is alliteration, that is the repetition of sounds that enhances melody is also used here very effectively. For example, in the line, but when the melancholy fit shall fall, so this repetition of fur sound, the salt sand wave and hide the green hill. In the third stanza, uh, the line, wheeled melancholy has her sovereign shrine, though seen of none save him whose strenuous tongue. So the repetition of sir sound are a few examples of alliteration. And students are required to find more such examples of alliteration from the poem. Besides these, the poetic devices like scissura and enjambment have also been used. They look similar, but they are not. So, scissura is a pause or a break in the line, usually done with comma, ellipsis, dash or a semicolon. Whereas, enjambment is the continuation of a sentence without a pause beyond the end of a line or couplet or stanza. Here we can see in the first two lines no, no, go not to Lethe, neither twist wolf's bane, tight rooted for its poisonous wine. So you can see that after Lethe there is a comma which pauses the thought and then Keith says neither twist. After neither twist, there is, uh, the line is over, but the thought continues and completes in the next line. So here we have examples of both scissura, that is the pause or break, and also of enjambment, that is a run on. Then similar to this, let's see the quatrain of the last stanza. The line begins with, she dwells with beauty, beauty that must die. So after beauty, there is a dash that breaks or pauses the thought. And in the next line, he begins talking about joy and says, and joy whose hand is ever at his lips. So after the word lips, the line ends, but the thought of joy or the sentence runs on to the next line and completes as bidding adieu. After bidding adieu, again there is a semicolon that marks a shift or change in the thought and a break in the metrical line and thereafter he starts talking about the aching pleasure nigh which further is continued to the next line as aching pleasure nigh turning to poison while the bee mouth sips. So the breaks are the scissuras and the continuation of the thought in the next lines are the examples of enjambment. So this was about the poem. In short, Keats has beautifully portrayed the emotional state of melancholy and has in fact celebrated this darker emotion. As a counsellor to the sufferer, he has told him what to do and what not to do when the person is melancholic.
The poetic devices have also been used very effectively and beautifully and have enhanced the beauty and melody of the poem. I hope it was easy to understand. Thank you.